So we have one piece of the uh, limits and arithmetic theorem left. And that is the one that people were trying to use just now, right? The, uh, the quotients. So, um, so we're still doing the limits and arithmetic. Theorem, right? And <coughs> as long as we, um, so we need, um, I should say this, it suffices, it suffices to prove this is the last, last part, right? So the last part is, of course, that, um, that if the limit, that if um, uh, S of n goes to S, and t sub n goes to t, and t is not equal to zero, then, um, then s sub n over t sub n goes to s over t, right? So that's, that's what we want to show. And um, it will suffice to prove that uh, uh, what's called lemma 9.5 in your, in your text, um, that um, if the limit of S sub n is S as n goes to infinity, um, and S is not zero, and uh, S sub n is not zero for all n, then the limit of one over S sub n as n goes to infinity is one over S. Because if we get this, then we can just, uh, you know, use the multiplication, use the multiplication part of the limits and arithmetic theorem, and say, well, if I know this is true, and I know that you know t sub n goes to t, then I take this product and I get t over s. Okay. So as long as I, you know, I don't have to prove this full blown statement. I just have to prove this lemma, and that will be enough. Okay. Everybody, all right with that? Yeah, Mark. Why doesn't the top one have the 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 bound boundedness? The, the the t t n cannot be zero for all n. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. I I should I should I was thinking to say something about that. So how come we only how come we're allowed to assume this seemingly strong statement that s of n is non-zero for all n down here, and in the upper one we don't say that, right? Why is it, why is it a why does it not matter that we assume that S of n is non-zero for all n? Well, the limit of the S of n is S, and S is non-zero. Okay. So how many of the um, how many of the S n could be equal to zero? Let me draw it this way. Let's draw a picture. Here's some S. It's not equal to zero. And the limit of the S of n is S. So what do you know about the S of n's being zero or non zero? How many of them are non zero? How many of them are zero, say? Finally many. Only finally many. Right? Only finally many. Because we know that after some point, right, there's some time past which everybody is away from zero. Okay, everybody's going to be at least, you know, more than half the distance away from zero. Okay, so there's only finitely many guys that where it equals to zero. Okay, there's finitely many guys. So yeah, there may be finitely many guys here that equal to zero, but they don't. They don't. It doesn't matter when you're talking about the limit because you, when you're talking about the limit, you're talking about what happens at infinity. Mm -hmm. Right? You don't care about these finitely guys here. So we might as well assume that they're all not zero because there's only finite many zero guys any, at the most anyway. Yeah. But it sounds like a contradiction. Like you're saying it's okay for finitely many to equal zero, but then you're saying S n doesn't equal zero for all n. You can like start n past which all of the zero terms. That's right. We we're gonna we basically just ignore. Um, so in the actual one, you know these guys converge to something non-zero. 
Okay. Ignore the, um, just start your, make your first time past the time when anybody is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Right, you've got this, so you say, okay, I've got this, I've got this second set of sequences, Sn prime and Tn prime. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna, be, and these are uh, gonna be the guys who are truncated, right? We throw away the first, you know, billion terms, uh, and we throw away all the guys where, where this is, where this equals zero, okay? And then we can say, oh look, by this theorem here, the limit of this is, is gonna be S over T. Right? But the limit of this is the same thing as the limit of this because they just disagreed in the first finitely many terms. Okay. So we don't have to worry about so it. In the lemma, would you just say then, like, for all n past n or something? Yeah, but we don't. Like I said, we don't need to. Okay. Right? So you know, we, we, right. we can okay. we can assume we can assume that that the, that none of them is zero. Okay. Right. So the point is that it's true that some of these guys might be zero. But they occur only in the finite time, in finite time, right? And so, and when you're talking about a limit, you don't care what happens in finite time. So, okay, um, okay. So let's prove this. Okay. So, uh, okay. So we want to show that the limit of this thing is is this. Um, okay, so as usual, we're going to do some scratch work. So do some scratch work. We say, okay, what's the epsilon condition? We, the epsilon condition is that 1 over Sn minus 1 over S. Uh, we're going to want that thing to be smaller than epsilon. Right? We want to make this thing smaller than epsilon. Right? Um, and we have, right, uh, uh, um, we want to control this we want to control this with this thing, S sub n minus s. Okay, because right, we we we're given that um, S n goes to s. Right. Right. That's that's what we're trying to show, right? If the S n go to s then 1 over Sn goes to 1 over S, right? So let's try and work this thing into, into the epsilon expression, okay? So you say, okay, well, it's sort of clear, it's there from the beginning, right? 1 over Sn minus 1 over, 1 over S is the same thing as S minus Sn over Sn times S. And um, we want to make this thing, we want to make this thing smaller than epsilon, right? And we're given, we're allowed to make this thing as small as we want, right? We're allowed to make this thing as small as we want. How do we make this thing smaller than epsilon? So I want you to think about that. See if you can tell me the answer. What do we, how close do we need to make these guys to each other to make this thing smaller than epsilon? How would you do it? Okay. Take one minute and see if you can. Take one minute and think about it. You don't have to, you don't have to do it, but I want you to think. Um, okay, let me, uh, let me give the actual proof. <laughs> okay. So, um, Okay, so we're gonna um, we want to make this thing smaller than epsilon. We're gonna play the the usual game of introducing some sort of I intermediate term, okay, something that's bigger than this and easy to control. Okay, so you say okay, well, um, so again we play the the morally speaking game. Okay, we say morally speaking, morally speaking, 
um, Sn is S, right? Sn turns into S. It's not true, right? But basically, that's true, right? So, um, <coughs> so in that case, what we get is that so this thing S minus Sn over Sn minus S is basically S minus Sn over S squared, right? And so if we want, we're going to want that thing to be smaller than epsilon. We want that thing to be smaller than epsilon. In other words, we want these guys to be, um, we want to take our epsilon to be, um, uh, we, we want these guys to be within um, epsilon. We want, what's oh, good. Um, Right, so we want um, we want this thing here to be smaller than um, epsilon times epsilon times the absolute value of s squared. Right. So if, as long as we can do that, then we'll be okay. Okay. But so that's 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 the idea. But of course, you know, this isn't actually equal to this. Actually, isn't equal to s. And so we play in the usual game. We say, okay, well, um, s n is actually not is not s, but we'll make it close enough. But close enough. Okay. You say, okay, well, look, um, <coughs> uh, there exists an end such that past, past that point, um, Sn exceeds, the absolute value of Sn exceeds absolute value of S over 2. Right. In other words, um, 1 over Sn is smaller than 2 over the absolute value of S. Okay. Um, but that means that um, S minus Sn over Sns over Sns is smaller than um, <coughs> smaller than 2 over S squared S minus Sn for n bigger than that n. Right? Okay. So um, so choose n2 such that if n exceeds n2, then S minus Sn is smaller than um, epsilon times s squared over 2. Right? So let me call this guy n1 here. Then let n be the max of n1 and n2. Right? If you're past that point, we see that 1 over n, Sn minus 1 over S, which equals S minus Sn over Sns, is <coughs> smaller than 2 S minus Sn over uh, S squared, but that's smaller than um, epsilon. Right? Because, because of this. Okay. Okay. Sorry to sorry to run you run you over time again. Okay.